when you're out in the world, it's hard to see your own mind. And as the Buddha says, the source of our deepest sufferings is our own mind. The way it reacts to things, the way it deals with things. So it's the most important thing we want to see in our lives. This is why we have to come to a quiet place like this. If you're disturbed, if you're distracted by things outside, you can't really see the operations of your own mind. It's only when you get out here you begin to see what's going on. And even then it takes time. Because so many times when we sit, settle down to meditate, all we can see is just the turmoil, turmoil in our minds. We wonder if there's ever going to be any peace or quiet in there. So this is why we try to maintain as much peace and quiet as we can wherever we are. Once you gain a taste of peace and quiet here, don't let go of it easily. Try to maintain it. Hang on to it. And try to get back in touch with it as much as you can. Because at the very least, that taste of peace and quiet can give us energy, recharge our batteries. and show us that it is possible to get the mind under control. It is possible for the mind to settle down and stay in place, at least for a little while. So this is why we stay with the breath, because the breath is a good place to settle down, not only when you're in your quiet spot like this, but when you go out in the world, because it's always there. Breath is always coming in, breath is always coming out. It's there for you to tap into at any time. And as you learn how to relate to the breath, here in this quiet spot. That can get you in touch with a lot of important principles you need to remember as you're out in the world. All too often we think of the Dharma as words, ideas, and as we're trying to keep those words and ideas in mind, it's difficult because you've got a lot of other things you've got to think about as well. But if you can develop the right attitude towards your breath, or the right relationship to your breath, then as soon as you get in touch with the breath, that relationship can get reestablished. So instead of having to memorize a lot of books and a lot of theory, just learn how to relate to your breath in a proper way, and that can embody a lot of the different principles that you've read about, that you've heard. And instead of thinking about the abstract ideas, you can actually have those relationships right here, right now. Tap into them whenever you need them. So the breath itself forms that quiet spot that you need. And John Lee, in a lot of his different Dharma talks and writings, pointed out how all the wings to awakening, which are the Buddha's basic teachings, can be related to how you relate to the breath. And the same principle holds true for a lot of other teachings as well. Last night in the Thai Dharma talk I was talking about how, reading from a John Lee, he was talking about how you have to have a sense of goodwill towards your breath, a sense of metta. Try to establish that relationship. Here you are sitting with your breath day in, day out. And think about how much you would like to have it be a comfortable breath, a good breath to be with. And how it only makes sense that because the breath is the basic force in your life that you would like to have it comfortable, at ease as well. You want to be on good terms with your breath. So this is sometimes difficult when we're meditating. We're trying so hard to stay with the object, and yet it seems to be slipping away, slipping away, almost as if it were an enemy. And if you develop that attitude, it's very difficult to stay with the breath. Remember, the breath is your friend. It's been keeping you alive all this time. And it's simply a matter of you're paying it some more attention, and it will do more things for you. If you sit there demanding that the breath look after you like this, breath take care of you like that, without your giving any input, without your putting any energy into it, it's not going to happen. Friendship doesn't work that way. So you pay careful attention to it. You pay careful attention to it. Watch how it comes in, watch how it goes out. Be, try to be as sensitive as possible to when the breath is too long or too short, either in the in-breath or the out-breath. If you catch yourself squeezing it towards the end of an out-breath, that's a sign you've let it go on too long. If you find yourself holding it in at the end of the in-breath, there's a bit of strain or tension there. Okay, you've been breathing in too long. 
So try to adjust it so it feels just right coming in, going out. There's a sense of ease and flow from the in-breath to the out-breath, the out-breath to the in-breath. And learn to make that the basic way you relate to your breath, so that in the course of a day, whether you're in the monastery or not, that when you get in touch with the breath again, you can reestablish that sense of friendship, that sense of being at home, at ease with the breath. Same principle applies to the remaining four Brahma-viharas. There's compassion. When the breath isn't going well, you make an effort to find what's wrong. Don't just leave it there uncomfortable. Make an effort to find where, what's the cause of the discomfort. This applies not only to the length of the breath, but also how deep the breath is and the different parts of the breath energy in the body. Make an effort to sort things out, clear things up wherever you sense the least bit of tension or tightness. Mudita, sympathetic joy, appreciation. Once the breath is going well, maintain it. Stay in touch with it. Keep looking after it. Whatever it needs to maintain that sense of well-being, just keep looking after it. Don't tell yourself, well, now I've gotten a little bit of comfort from the breath and go on and do think, thinking about other things, being concerned about other things. While you're sitting here, Try to maintain whatever sense of well-being you can have. Keep it going as long as you can imagine, longer than you might imagine. Just keep at it, at it, at it, at it. Don't let yourself get bored. If boredom comes in, question the boredom. Don't question the breath. Don't drop the breath. Keep looking after it, tending to it, to see if that sense of well-being can grow stronger. Now, sometimes you'll find that there are areas of the breath energy in the body that you can't do anything about. Okay, that's when you have to develop equanimity, the fourth of the brahma -baharas. As John Lee says, it's like going into a house where some of the floorboards are rotten. You don't lie down on the rotten floorboards. You walk around them. If you're going to lie down, you lie down someplace else, realizing the body cannot be made perfect. So you focus on the areas where things are going well. You focus on the things that you can have some effect on. This is a very basic lesson in the difference between present karma and past karma. Sometimes the results of past karma are pretty intransigent. You can't do much with them, so you work around them and emphasize the areas where it does feel good, emphasize the areas where you can make a difference. This gives you an intuitive sense of what equanimity means. It doesn't mean that you just get indifferent to everything or don't put out any effort at all. It means you're selective about where your effort is well spent and focus your effort where, where it does show results. As for things you can affect, just be aware of them, but don't fight them needlessly. Don't waste your energy on them. This way, as you get to Relate to the breath in the proper way, with goodwill, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity. You get more than just an abstract sense of what those words mean. You get a more intuitive sense of how they work and how it applies to what you're doing in the present moment, how you can create a sense of inner calm, inner peace inside, which allows the mind to settle down gives you a sense of strength, gives you a sense of well-being in whatever the situations might be. One of my students in Massachusetts called up yesterday, said he'd been attending a demonstration workshop on biofeedback. He was hoping that the woman who was running the biofeedback demonstration would have something to teach him. And so when they asked for volunteers in the audience to sit down in her biofeedback machine, he was the first to raise his hand. So he got up there and first she had him think about something that was disturbing. And so he did, and his pulse rate went up and his breathing rate changed, his body temperature changed, all the physical symptoms were there. And then she said, okay, now try, try your best to drop that thought. So he immediately went to his breath. And within two seconds he said all the bodily data that was being registered by the machine dropped way back down to normal. And the woman running this machine said she'd never seen anybody drop it so fast. Then she pinched him to see if he could get the 
the readings up again. No, they did. His heartbeat raised again. It was sudden and unexpected, so his heartbeat sped up. His breathing rate changed. His body temperature changed quickly. And she said, okay, now try to drop that. And he did, again. Again, she said she'd never seen anybody change physically so fast. She wanted to know what he did, and so he said, oh, he's doing breath meditation. She wanted to know what method was, and so instead of learning something from her, he ended up learning, having to teach her something. So this ability to get back in touch with your breath and have the right relationship to the breath is an important skill to have. You can take it with you wherever you go. That's why when things outside are unfriendly, tend to impinge too much on the mind, you return to the breath and reestablish that relationship. At the same time, it helps give you an understanding of the Dharma, because the understanding here is a relationship to something that's immediate. It's not just abstractions. You can sit around all day and talk about, well, what does equanimity really mean? What does goodwill really mean? And you can develop all kinds of ideas and objections to the abstractions. But when you actually develop those relationships with your breath, you find they really are a good thing. You understand them more deeply because they're part of something you do and not just something you think about or read about. So while you're here in this quiet corner, do your best to create a quiet corner inside by establishing a good relationship with the breath, a relationship that embodies a lot of the principles that we're learning about. That way when you leave this quiet corner, you have all those principles with you in an immediate, visceral, and very useful way. And that way you have a, a quiet corner wherever you go, even out in the noisy world outside. You've got your quiet corner within. You've got that good relationship within. Regardless of how your relationships are going with other people, you've still got this good inner relationship, and that in and of itself can be nourishing, strengthening. It gives your mind the support it needs that the world outside is not giving it. At the same time, it trains you to be on better terms inside so that you're causing yourself less and less suffering for yourself. So this is one of those skills that has lots and lots of ramifications, all of them for the good. So be careful while you have this opportunity here. Make the most of it. The more consistently you can be on good terms with the breath, then the easier it will be to tap into that, that good relationship, even in difficult circumstances.